AC tenía un contrato discográfico con Megaforce Records que llegó a su fin en 1990 después del lanzamiento de Trouble Walking y podríamos decir que comenzó una nueva etapa con su banda durante la primera mitad de los años 90 antes de se reunir a Kiss pero él no se fue capaz de conseguir cualquier interés en los celos discográficos para lanzar un nuevo álbum. Aún él siempre decía que estaba trabajando en nuevo material. Usted sí quedó con él hasta el año 1993. Lo que en su opinión fue la razón para el es del atraso en la estabilización de su carrera. Yeah, I was worked with Ace all through the years, the Megaforce years, uh, as I mentioned before. And Eddie Trunk was uh, worked at Megaforce, and he um, uh, he helped out Ace a lot. Uh, he was a big fan of Kiss and a big fan of Aces. So Eddie Trunk is now a, a DJ here, and um, and he knows his rock history, so to speak, and he interviews a lot of people, and he still supports Ace a lot. After Megaforce, uh, I, yeah, it was. Yeah, Ace was having a tough time in his career because he, uh, like I said, he didn't put the extra effort. He didn't think he had to because he, he thought he had uh, the star power behind them, and he didn't realize what a uh, he what a struggle it was going to be uh, starting over without Kiss. Ace was always, you know, treated like a star all the time, and um, and when he went solo, uh, Ace didn't realize the roller coaster. Uh, that having a career in the entertainment business is um, you have to work hard to stay on top. I hate to say it, I don't want to, go to say things negative, but Ace was lazy and that, that was his problem. And Ace's name was kind of toxic, I don't know if you understand that term, uh, poisoned or toxic because of, because of the things that uh, you know he did uh, with his uh, problem with the drinking. When he toured um, at the time, he was touring clubs, and uh, some of the clubs weren't full. You know, they, he'd hit certain areas, and he'd sell out. You know, clubs a thousand people, fifteen hundred people, and then he'd go into another state and then to another city, and uh, um, and then there'd be a hundred people would show up. You know, and so it wasn't uh, consistent. You know, record companies want to go with uh, tried and true, successful artist that's going to work hard for for them. And they kind of saw Ace's track record with Megaforce, and he didn't work hard enough with Megaforce. So he had to live and learn a little bit. But the drinking kind of numbed the learning part. Yeah, that's unfortunate. You know, Ace, really talented guy, really unbelievable guitar player. When Ace does get inspired, you know, he, he comes out with great stuff and can really play and. Uh, that, that's when I liked hanging out with Ace, when he was inspired and motivated. Unfortunately, it was a roller coaster. Like, that's why we're discussing it now. Uh, and that's why I discussed in the book Kiss and Tell. Aparte de la cuestión discográfica, Ace tenía otros problemas. La alineación de la banda no era estable, ya que hubo muchos cambios en la batería en la posición bajista. There was a lot of talented people in this band. Well, Ace did have a, a lot of uh, personnel changes. Uh, he had, and we had a little joke. You, you won't get it you, being in Argentina, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, uh, Ace went through more bass players than the New York Mets baseball team went through third baseman. Uh, Ace, had, he had a lot of drummers and uh, great drummers. He had Jamie Oldacre from uh, Eric Clapton and obviously Anton Figg, and Billy Ward, another great, great drummer. Uh, wasn't the same Billy Ward that played with uh, Black Sabbath, uh, different guy. Uh, and that Billy was in the uh, Rock Soldiers video. And Sandy Slavin, a uh, great drummer. He quit on the road because um, he couldn't put up with Ace's antics. Anton had his gig with David Letterman, uh, and he wouldn't leave David Letterman, which was a good move because, uh, you know, if Anton committed to Ace, he would have been in a not so uh, lucrative uh, gig, so to speak. He had the better gig at David Letterman. 
after John Regan, uh, you know, Ace went through a lot, a lot of bass players. He had uh, James uh, Lomenzo. I mean, he was into progressive rock like I was, uh, into King Crimson and Emerson Lake and Palmer and stuff. So I got along with James, and, and his birthday's the same day as mine. Yeah, that was kind of cool, Capricorn. Um, James was a good guy, and uh, he ended up leaving Ace. I mean, these guys were pro guys that played with a lot of bands and, uh, and in a lot of professional situations, and they saw where Ace was coming from. And, you know, if Ace wasn't going to care about his own band that had his name on it, you know, you're not going to keep these pro players uh, playing with them. So that, that was the problem there. Su relación con Ace terminó de la peor manera. En la corte, acusado por malversación de fondos en relación con Rock Soldiers S.A., el antiguo club de fans de Ace, cuando se declaró en quiebra después de que el programa de MTV Unplugged y antes de la reunión tour. En la lista de acreedores de Ace, su nombre no era es el único. John Regan y muchos otros también estaban ahí. ¿Cómo te las arreglas para llegar a un acuerdo con él es con sus abogados? Now, your, the way your question reads is uh, that Ace took me to court and, uh, for embezzlement, and that was never the case. Ace accused me of embezzlement, which means stealing, um, from uh, Rock Soldiers Incorporated. And uh, he accused me of this publicly uh, with all the fans, and he wrote a letter to all the Rock Soldier fans saying I was stealing it. And he was really slandering me. He was ruining my good name, and, I, and that was something you shouldn't have done to your best friend, supposedly. That's why the Kiss and Tell book got written. Uh, people don't realize it. I mean, I get a lot of criticism from fans that don't get the whole story correct. And they uh, point fingers at me and saying I, uh, I shouldn't have wrote, written that, that book about Ace. Uh, unfortunately, they got the facts wrong. And uh, the reason why I, I, I'm justified in writing the book Kiss and Tell uh, was because Ace pointed fingers at me publicly and accused me of stealing. And he pointed fingers at his best friend. We have a term here in the United States saying uh, throw, uh, throw somebody under the bus. That means uh, you take a guy and dispose of him. And, and that was pretty awful on Ace's part, to throw me under the bus. He knows that I did not steal from him. Publicly, he told his fans that I stole from him. And then uh, in bankruptcy papers, he said, uh, which means official government papers, he said he owed me money. So you can't have it both ways. To clarify the the whole bankruptcy thing, uh, Ace did not take me to court. I took him, I went to court with him uh, when he claimed bankruptcy and the court said that, I, uh, that Ace owed me the money. Ace claimed bankruptcy and, nobody, and so, so many other people, uh, 20, 30 people on his list of people he owed, family, friends, business uh, people. And uh, Ace kind of, he screwed over a lot, a lot of people, damaged his uh, name and his career uh, in the in inner circle of the, the music business. And anybody that knows me in the music business, uh, I have so many other celebrity friends, knows that I was justified in writing Kiss and Tell, and I wrote it in defense. Uh, I mean, Ace accused me of something and uh, publicly, and I answered him publicly, and it turned into a, a big book, you know, a, a big best-selling book, which was uh, surprised me. Yeah. How did I manage an agreement with Aces and his lawyers? They're, they're, we didn't. <laughs> we didn't manage an agreement. The court said that Ace owed me money. Ace went through bankruptcy, and uh, the lawyers just said, uh, "You're out of luck, buddy. Uh, Ace has no money." Also, Ace lied to the judge. Ace knew that he would have to pay all these people uh, once the. KISS tour, the KISS reunion tour uh, kicked in and all that money was going to come in. So that's why he uh, claimed bankruptcy. So he kind of screwed over a lot of people, uh, not just me. And uh, that's, a, that's a shame that Ace would go to those lengths. Very kind of selfish. 
Su libro coescrito con Bobby McAdams es un de los favoritos para los fans de Kiss. Hay muchas historias hilarantes, así como algunas más increíbles. Alguna vez algún problema con él es en relación con las historias contenidas en el libro. Oh, the Kiss and Tell book uh, with my co-author Bob McAdams, and Bob was best friends with Ace before Kiss. Bob said he read the uh, ad in the Village Voice and brought it over to Ace, and and Bob was going to try out for Kiss. It wasn't called Kiss at the time, and Ace said he was going to audition too. So then it was Bob and Ace that went to the audition uh, for, for Kiss. Did I have any problems with Ace uh, directly with the book? No, I've I heard Ace do interviews on on a radio on radio shows and kind of dismiss the book. Um, he did that on Eddie Trunk's show, and then uh, Howard Stern called uh, what when. Ace was in the studio at Howard, Howard Stern's big radio DJ here in the United States. And uh, the producers uh, called me and wanted to, me to confront them on the air um, over the telephone. And one of the producers warned Ace and he stormed off uh, the Howard Stern show. That's like a backstory. So if you look up uh, Ace Frehley on Howard Stern and you see him uh, bolt out of there really quick, uh, it was because he had... Um, Gary Delabate had uh, me on the phone, and uh, I th believe he had Wendy Moore on the phone also, the, the uh, author of the book Into the Void with Ace Frehley. So, um, and uh, Ace didn't want to be confronted by us, so uh, he ran out.